When we consider the curves describing the path or the trajectory of a moving body, we use the elapsed time t as a parameter of the curve. We also saw that the position vector r with the running time parameter t describes the space curve along which a point mass moves as time passes. In this figure, a point mass moving along a curve and it reaches the point p at the instant of time t0. The position p on the curve is given by the position vector r t0. The velocity of the point mass is described by the velocity vector v t0, which is the tangent to the curve at the point p. At the instant of time t1, the point mass will reach the point p', prime, described by the position vector of t1. The velocity of the point mass at the point p' prime is given by the tangent vector v t1 to the curve at that point. Then we can compute the arc length of the curve between the points p and p'. Prime. The arc length s is the integral of the length of tangent of the curve over the interval between t0 and t1, where the tangent is the parametric derivative of the position vector r. The arc length covered by the moving body between the points p and p' prime is indicated with the green curve. If we fix the point p at the initial time t0 and let the parameter t run with the position of the point p', prime, we obtain the arc length s as a function of t. Then the arc length s is the integral of the length of the tangent of the position vector between the initial time t0 and t. If the length of the tangent does not vanishes over a given interval of time t, then the arc length s is an invertible function of t over that interval, and we can express the time parameter as the function of the arc length s. Then the space curves can be parametrized with respect to the arc length, that is the position vector can be written as a function of the arc length s. As a result, we can establish the relation between the derivative of the curve with respect to the time parameter t and its derivative with respect to the arc length s. R dot is the derivative of the position vector with respect to the time parameter t. For this derivative we can apply the chain rule, by writing it as the derivative of the position vector r with respect to the arc length s, times the derivative of the arc length s with respect to the time t. Let us denote the derivative with respect to the arc length s by the symbol prime. Then, r dot is equal to r prime times s dot. Since the derivative of the arc length s is the length of the tangent, that is the derivative of the position vector r with respect to the parameter t, we have r prime times the length of r dot. As a result, we can express the derivative of the position vector with respect to the arc length, as the ratio of its time derivative to the length of its time derivative. We also see that the derivative of the position vector with respect to the arc length has a unit length, that is it is the unit tangent to the curve. The second order time derivative of the position vector is just the derivative of r dot, which is r prime times s dot. If we apply the Leibniz rule for differentiation of the product in the parenthesis, we obtain two terms. The time derivative of r prime times s dot, plus r prime times s double dot. The first terms gives the square of the time derivative of the arc length s, times the second order derivative of the position vector r with respect to the arc length. The second term is equal to the second order derivative of the arc length s, times the derivative of the position vector r with respect to the arc length. Now we have expressed the first and second order time derivatives of the position vector in terms of its derivatives with respect to the arc length. We will use these expressions to construct a set of a basis vectors attached to the moving body. This set of basis vectors moving along an arbitrary curve is called as frenet serret frame after the two French mathematicians and physicists who introduced it. If we want to construct such a frame we need to ask the question, what are the preferred directions in space at a given point P of a curve RT? The answer is based on the shape of the curve. One of the possible preferred directions is for example given by the unit tangent of the curve T at the point P, which is the derivative of the position vector R with respect to the arc length. The second preferred direction related to the curve RT at the point P is given by the normal vector N, which is the normalized derivative of the unit tangent. We will demonstrate that the normal vector N is perpendicular to the tangent T. The last preferred direction is given by the binormal vector B, which is simply defined as the cross product of the tangent T and the normal vector N. By definition, the binormal vector B is perpendicular to both the tangent and the normal vector, as it is shown in the figure. We will also prove that, the triplet T, N and B is an orthonormal set of vectors. By definition, the tangent and the normal vector have unit lengths. Since the length of any vector can be written as the scalar product with itself, the derivative of the scalar product of any unit vector, for example the tangent T, with itself vanishes. As a result, the derivative of T times T is equal to zero. 
If we apply the Leibniz rule for the derivative of the dot product, we obtain 2 times the dot product of t and t prime. Then the scalar product of t and t prime vanishes, which means the tangent t is perpendicular to its derivative. Since the normal vector n is just the normalization of the derivative of the tangent with respect to the arc length, the tangent t is also perpendicular to the normal vector n. We can compute the length of the binormal vector by applying its definition. Since b is the cross product of t and n, which are perpendicular to each other, the square of the length of b is equal to the length of t squared times the length of n squared. Here the vectors t and n have unit length, thus the vector b is also a unit vector. Then the fernet serret frame, t, n and b forms an orthonormal basis traveling along the curve. We can introduce the notation ei for this basis, with the index i running through the triplet t, n and b. Then the orthogonality condition can be formulated as the dot product of EI and EJ is equal to the Kronecker delta with the indices I and J. If we expand the vector R in this orthonormal basis, we can write R as the linear combination of the basis vectors, where the expansion coefficients of the basis vector EI are given by their dot products with R. We can also expand the derivative of the basis vector EI with respect to the arc length in the basis itself. Here the expansion coefficient is equal to the scalar product of EI prime and EJ. If we take the derivative of the orthogonality condition, then the derivative of the Kronecker delta vanishes, and so is the derivative of the dot product of EI and EJ. Applying the Leibniz rule, we obtain that EI prime times EJ plus EI times EJ prime is equal to zero. This shows that EI prime times EJ is equal to minus EI times EJ prime. If the index i is equal to the index j, both sides of this equation must vanish. Then we just have a vanishing dot product of ei prime and ei, that is the any basis vector is perpendicular to its derivative, as we expect for unit vectors. If we define the matrix aij with the entries a prime times ej, we see that this matrix is antisymmetric and trace-free, which follows from its antisymmetry. Let us denote the non-vanishing off-diagonal elements of this matrix with alpha, kappa and tau. Now we can use this matrix form and we write the basis expansion of the derivative of the basis vectors as a matrix vector multiplication, where the matrix Aij is multiplied by a vector with the basis vectors as elements. For the given matrix elements, we can determine the result of this multiplication. In order to obtain the derivative of the first basis vector, we multiply the first row of the matrix with the vector form from the basis vectors. This gives kappa times E2 plus alpha times E3. The derivative of the second basis vector is given by the multiplication of the second row of the matrix with the vector of basis vectors. Then we have minus kappa times E1, plus tau times E3. The last equation of the matrix multiplication is an expression of the derivative of the third basis vector, which is the multiplication of the third row of the matrix with the vector of basis vectors. This multiplication gives minus alpha times E1, minus tau times E2. Since the set of the basis vectors EI is an arbitrary orthonormal set, these three equations hold for any orthonormal set of vectors. Now let us consider the fernet serret frame as a special case of the orthonormal sets, where the basis vector E1 is equal to the tangent T. The basis vector E2 is equal to the normal vector N. And the basis vector E3 is equal to the binormal vector B. Then the general equations can be written in the following special forms. The derivative of the tangent t is equal to kappa times the normal n, plus alpha times the binormal b. The derivative of the normal n is equal to minus kappa times the tangent t, plus tau times the binormal b. And the derivative of the binormal b is equal to minus alpha times the tangent t, minus tau times the normal n. But we also know that the normal vector n is defined as the normalized derivative of the tangent t. This means that the derivative of the tangent t is equal to its length times the normal vector n. By applying this expression, we can eliminate the derivative of the tangent t from the first equation. Then we see that the function alpha has to vanish, and the function kappa is just the length of the derivative of the tangent t. As a result, we can reduce these equations into a set of equations, which is called as the fernet serret formulae. Namely, the first formula just tells that the derivative of the tangent t along a curve with respect to the arc length is equal to kappa times the normal vector n of the curve. The second fernet serret formula expresses the derivative of the normal vector n along the curve with respect to the arc length, as minus kappa times the tangent t, plus tau times the binormal vector b. The third formula states that, 
the derivative of the binormal vector b is simply minus tau times the normal vector n. We can also give the matrix form of the fernet serret formula, where the left-hand side of the derivative of the column vector constructed from the vectors t, n, and b, and the right-hand side is the multiplication of the antisymmetric matrix containing the two non-vanishing elements kappa and tau, with the column vector constructed from the frame vectors. Here the function kappa is defined as the length of the derivative of the tangent t and identified as the curvature of the curve at the parameter s. The function tau is equal to minus the dot product of the normal vector n and the derivative of the binormal vector b, which can be computed from the dot product of the third fernet serret equation and the normal vector n. Here the function tau is called as the torsion of the curve at the parameter s. We can demonstrate that the geometric meaning of these functions are indeed the curvature and the torsion of the curve in a given point. We can examine what kind of planes are spanned by the fernet serret frame at an arbitrary point on a curve, and what is their relation with the shape of the curve. But before doing that, we can check the consistency of the fernet serret formulae with respect to the functions kappa and tau. We start with the multiplication of the second fernet serret formula by the tangent t, which gives t times the derivative of the normal n in the left-hand side, and minus kappa times the dot product of t with itself, plus tau times the dot product of the t and the binormal b. Since t is a unit vector and perpendicular to b, we conclude from this equation that the function kappa is equal minus 1 times the dot product of t and the derivative of n. The normal vector n is perpendicular to the tangent t therefore their scalar product vanishes. As a result, the derivative of their scalar product is also zero, for which we can apply the Leibniz rule. If we substitute this expression into the original equation, then we obtain the dot product of n and the derivative of t. Of course, we can remember that the tangent t is the first basis vector and the normal n is the second one in the fernet serret frame, which means the first equality is minus e1 times the derivative of e2, that is, the element a12, and the second equality follows from the anti-symmetry of the matrix aij. Thus, we have the dot product of n and the derivative of t, where n is just the normalized derivative of t. Since t times t is the square of the length of t, we obtain the length of the tangent t, which is the function kappa. Then we have a consistent result. We can also multiply the second fernet serret formula by the binormal vector b. Here, b times n prime is equal to minus kappa times the dot product of b and t, plus tau times the dot product of b with itself. As b times t vanishes and b is a unit vector, we can write tau as the dot product of b and the derivative of n. We can use the anti-symmetry of the matrix aij again, with b equal to e3 and n equal to e2. That gives minus n times b prime for the function tau, which is just its definition. Then we see that second fernet serret formula gives a completely consistent result. Now we can introduce the concept of the osculating plane at a point p on a curve, as the limit of a series of planes passing through the point p, p prime, and p double prime on the curve, where the p prime and p double prime are approaching p. Thus we have a curve R's with an arbitrary point p, and the points p prime and p double prime in the vicinity of p. These three points define a plane passing through these points, and this definition is unique, provided the curve is no a straight line. Then we can move the points p prime and p double prime along the curve so that they are closer to the point p. Then the new points with the point p determine another plane. We can choose the new points p prime and p double prime even closer to the point p, defining another plane with this new point set. We can continue this process with a series of point pairs p prime and p double prime which are approaching the point P on the curve. As a result, we obtain a series of planes passing through the points P, P prime, and P double prime. In the limiting case, the points P prime and P double prime are getting infinitely close to the point P, and the limit of the series of planes is defined as the osculating plane. Actually, the osculating plane in a given point P of the curve can be determined by the fernet serret frame in that point as well, since the plane is spanned by the tangent T and the normal end of the curve at the given point. This also means that the binormal vector b is the normal of the osculating plane in the point p. Based on the application of the fernet serret frame, we can also define the normal plane of the curve in the point p, as the plane spanned by the normal n, and the binormal b. Then the normal vector of the normal plane is the tangent t of the curve in the point p. A third plane, called rectifying plane, can also be defined as the plane spanned by the tangent t and the binormal b at the point p. Then the normal vector of the rectifying plane is the normal end of the curve in the point P. In this table we can summarize the three planes, the set of vectors spanning them, and their normal vectors. 
If the order of the planes in the table is the osculating plane, the normal plane, and the rectifying plane, then we can just permute the three vectors in each row to get the corresponding vectors in the next row of the table. In fact we only need the osculating plane to give the geometric interpretation of the curvature kappa and the torsion tau. Let us start with the geometric interpretation of the function kappa as the curvature of a spatial curve in a given point. We define kappa as the length of the derivative of the tangent t with respect to the arc length. We used curves parametrized with arc length, and proved that the derivative of the position vector r with respect to the curve parameter t is equal to the product of the derivative of r with respect to the arc length, and the derivative of the arc length s with respect to t. That is, r dot is equal to r prime times s dot, where we use the chain rule for the derivatives of composite functions. This rule can also be applied to the derivative of the tangent t, which tells us that t dot is equal to t prime times s dot. Then we can express the length of the t prime as the ratio of the length of t dot to s dot, where we suppose that the arc length s is a monotonic increasing function of the curve parameter t. In this figure, we can see a spatial curve with the position vector r s, pointing from the reference point o to the point p on the curve. We use the arc length s measured along the curve as the parameter of the curve. The tangent t of the curve at the point p depends on the arc length as well. Now, let us consider the point P' prime at the distance ds from the point P along the curve. Its position vector r and its tangent t are evaluated at the parameter s plus ds. We see that the direction and even the length of the tangent vectors can be different at the two points in the case of general spatial curves. If we translate the tangent from the point P to the point P', prime, we can measure the angle phi between the tangent at P' prime and the translated vector. Let us denote the difference of these two vectors with the vector delta t. If the change ds in the arc's length parameter is small, then the length of the difference vector delta t is also small. In this case, the squared length of the differential dt of the vector t can be approximated with the one of delta t, which is the scalar product of the difference ts plus ds, minus ts with itself. If we break up the brackets, we can write the square of the length as the sum of the squared lengths of the vectors ts plus ds, and ts, minus 2 times the dot product of the vectors ts plus ds and ts. Since the tangent t is defined as a unit vector, the sum of the first two terms in the right-hand side is equal to 2, and we can substitute the definition of the scalar product in the last term. Then the result is equal to the length of the vector ts plus ds times the length of the vector ts times cosine phi. The lengths of the vectors are unity again, and we obtain 2 times 1, minus cosine phi for the squared length of the vector dt. As we said, since ds is small, the angle phi is also tiny, which allows us to approximate cosine phi with its Taylor expansion in the first order. This gives 1 minus half phi squared. We can insert the approximation into the square length formula of dt and take its square root. The result is simply the magnitude of phi. If we multiply the first equation on the top with dt time s dot, where dt is the infinitesimal difference in the parameter t, then we can write the length of the vector dt as s dot times kappa times dt, since t dot is just the derivative of the tangent vector with respect to the curve parameter. Then we see that the length of dt reduces to the expression kappa times ds. From the last two equations we conclude that the magnitude of phi is equal to the function kappa times ds. Now we can divide this expression with ds, and as a result we can state that the curvature kappa measures the infinitesimal change in the direction of the unit tangent to the curve. That is, the function kappa is equal to the magnitude of the derivative of the angle phi with respect to the arc length s. Here we define the curvature radius rc as the inverse of the curvature kappa. Then, an infinitesimal change in the arc length s along the curve at a point p, is equal to the curvature radius of the curve at that point, times the infinitesimal change in the direction of the unit tangent vector to the curve. If we take the point p on the curve r as with its tangent vector t and the normal vector n erected at p, then we can draw the osculating circle with the curvature radius rc and the center c of the circle in the direction of the normal vector n. The osculating circle is laying in the osculating plane spanned by the vectors t and n. The smaller the radius rc of the curve in the point p, the greater the curvature kappa of the curve is in that point. If the curve is a straight line, then the radius of the osculating circle becomes infinite in each point of the line, that is the curvature is zero along the line. This is the geometric interpretation of the function kappa. We can also provide a geometric interpretation of the function tau as the torsion of the spatial curves. It goes as follows. 
the torsion is given by the dot product of the normal n and the derivative of the binormal b. By definition of the scalar product, this expression measures the infinitesimal change in the direction of the binormal relative to the normal of the curve. Let us examine this definition in a greater detail. Here we can see the fernet serret frame at the point P on the curve RS. When we move along the curve from the point P to the point P', prime, the frame also moves along the curve. In the case of a general curve, the directions of the frame vectors will change with respect to those of the frame vectors at the original position. Now we can translate the binormal B form the point P to P', prime, and take the difference vector delta B between the translated vector and B. If we translate the vector delta B into the point P', prime, we can just project it onto the normal n, and denote the length of this projection with tau. If the function tau vanishes, then the third fernet serret formula implies that the derivative of the binormal vector B vanishes in the direction of normal vector as well. This is represented by the vanishing projection of the difference vector delta B onto the normal direction in the figure. As a result, we see that the binormal B does not depend on the arc length but it is constant along the curve. If we denote the arc length with S0 at the point P and with S at the point P', prime, we can define the function f depending on s by the dot product of the vector pointing from p to p prime and the binormal vector. Here the vector p p prime is simply the difference of the position vectors are with the arc length parameter s and s0. It follows from that definition that the function at s0 vanishes, and the derivative of f is equal to our prime times b, since our s0 times b is a constant. By using the definition of the tangent, we can substitute the vector r prime with the tangent t, which is perpendicular to the vector b. Then we obtain that the derivative of f vanishes. That is the function f is constant. But we already know that the function f at s0 is 0, which means that the function f is identically 0. As a result, the vector p p' prime is perpendicular to the vector b for any arc length parameter s. Then our main conclusion is that the curve rs is a plane curve lying in the oscillating plane. Remember, that the binormal vector b is the normal of the oscillating plane. Now we can check what the first two fernet serret formulae give, if the function tau vanishes. The first formula states that the derivative of the tangent is equal to kappa times the normal vector n, that is it does not depend on tau. Whereas the second formula reduces to a simple expression, stating that the derivative of the normal n is equal minus kappa times the tangent t. These two equations tell us that the tangent t evolves in the direction of n, and the normal vector n evolves in the direction of t as we are moving along the curve. Since the tangent t and the normal n are spanning the oscillating plane, this evolution equations also show that the curve remains in the oscillating plane determined in the original point p at the arc length parameter s0. Then we demonstrated that the torsion tau measures the rate which the curve lifts or twists up off the oscillating plane for an infinitesimal change in the arc length parameter along the curve. By introducing the fernet serret frame, we can describe the velocity and the acceleration of a body moving along an arbitrary spatial curve in a convenient way. We already determined the first and second order derivatives of the position vector are with respect to the time, that is with respect to the parameter t of the curve. Its first order derivative is the derivative of the arc length s with respect to the time, multiplied by the derivative of the position vector r with respect to the arc length. That is, r dot is equal to s dot times r prime. The second order derivative of the position vector, that is our double dot is equal to s dot squared times our double prime, plus s double dot times our prime. The magnitude of the velocity is the speed, which is the time derivative of the arc length, that is the path covered in a given time. Since the speed v is equal to s dot, and the tangent t is defined as our prime, we can write the velocity vector as the speed times the tangent vector. This result shows, that the velocity vector of the body points into the direction of the tangent to the path of the moving body, as we expected. The tangential component at of the acceleration is the the time derivative of the speed, which is equal to the second order time derivative of the arc length, that is s double dot. The vector r double prime is simply equal to t prime. Then the acceleration vector can be written as the tangent t multiplied by the tangential component at of the acceleration, plus the speed v squared times the derivative of the tangent t with respect to the arc length. Now we apply the first for an et serret formula stating that the derivative of the tangent t with respect to the arc length is equal to the curvature times the normal vector n. Then we can write the acceleration vector as the tangential component of the acceleration times the tangent t, plus the square of the speed v times the curvature kappa multiplied by the normal vector n. 
Here the second term is the square of the speed divided by the curvature radius, times the normal vector n. Then the velocity and the acceleration in the frenet serret frame at the point P on the curve Rs are the following. The tangential component of the velocity is equal to the time derivative of the arc length, and it has no normal and binormal components. The tangential component of the acceleration is the time derivative of the speed, or the second-order time derivative of the arc length. The normal components of the acceleration is equal to the ratio of the speed squared to the curvature radius of the path measured at the position of the body. The binormal component of the acceleration vanishes. In the figure we can see the curve Rs with the frenet serret frame at the point P, and the osculating circle with the radius Rc. These equations restate that the velocity vector V points into the tangential direction of the curve at the point P. At the same time, there is a tangential component of the acceleration, and it only depends on the change in the speed, while the shape of the trajectory of the moving body is irrelevant. However, the acceleration has a normal component, which depends on both the speed of the body, and the shape of the curve representing the path of the moving body. This means if a body is moving along a curved path, then its acceleration vector will not vanish, even if the body moves with a constant speed.